Welcome to the Future of Life Institute podcast. My name is Gus Docker, and I'm here with Dan Hendricks. Dan is the director of the Center for AI Safety. Dan, welcome to the podcast. Glad to be back. You are also an advisor to XAI. Maybe you can tell us a bit about that. Uh, sure. So XAI is um, Elon's new AGI project. It's still very much in its early stages, so it's difficult to um, say specific things about what they'll be doing or what the specific high-level strategy is. To, to give a sense, Elon has um, been interested in the uh, failure mode of sort of eroded epistemics, um, where people don't uh, have a shared sense of consensus reality, and this might make it harder for a civilization to like appropriately function. There are other types of um, extras that he's concerned about as well. His sort of probability of doom uh, or of that of an existential catastrophe is around like 20 to 30 percent. So he takes this, I would guess, more seriously than um, than any other leader of a major um, AGI organization. But exactly how one goes about reducing that risk is still is still somewhat to be determined. There is an interest in building more truth seeking AIs. But, you know, on, on other occasions, too, he'd mention that we should have AIs with the objective of preserving human autonomy or maximizing their freedom of action. And on other instances, uh, in thinking about good objectives for AI systems, having them uh, increase net civilizational happiness over time. So I think that this reflects sort of a plurality of, of, of different goals that uh, he thinks AI systems should end up uh, pursuing um, rather than um, uh, picking just exactly or rather than just picking one. I think it's relevant to note that it's a fairly serious effort. I'd anticipate that it would probably be one of the uh, main three AI companies um, uh, next year or the, the year after, uh, like uh, OpenAI, Google DeepMind, um, and XAI. Uh, so I, I, I don't think of it as a, uh, a, a smaller effort, uh, but uh, uh, has the, the capacity to have a substantial ratio of force. So. The other uh, top AI corporations you mentioned, Anthropic, Google DeepMind, OpenAI, have backing from, from uh, giant tech uh, companies. Uh, does XAI similarly have some backing from, from Tesla, for example? I can't uh, specifically uh, say about that, but this is, more, um, this is not a, a subpart of Tesla. This is not um, an organization inside of Twitter or X, and it's not an organization inside of, of Tesla. The main topic of conversation for this episode is your paper on catastrophic risks from AI and specifically categorizing these risks. So you categorize risks from uh, catastrophic risks from AI in, in, in four different categories. Maybe we, we should just start by sketching out those categories and then go into depth later. Yeah, so I guess at a very abstract level, there's um, <clears throat> risks if people are trying to use AI's intentionally to cause harm. That's a basic one. So there's an intentional intentional catastrophe that would be malicious use. Another one is where there are accidents. And um, if there are accidents, this would often be the consequence of the AI developers uh, using these very powerful systems or potentially leaking them um, or accidentally putting in some bad objective or doing some gain of function. But that would be some accident risk. So that's relates to organizational risks or organizational safety. Uh, the third would be these environmental or structural risks, basically where AI companies are, or um, AI developers, be those companies, or maybe in later stages, countries are racing uh, to build more and more powerful AI systems or AI weapons. And this structural risk uh, incentivizes companies to, um, or, or these developers to seed more and more decision-making and control to these AI systems. We get a looser and looser leash. Uh, things move very quickly. We become extremely dependent on them. This gets us in an, an, irreversible, uh, uh, an irreversible position where we are not actually making the decisions, but um, we're basically having nominal control. It's very possible in that situation we just ultimately end up losing control to the sort of very complicated, fast-moving system that we create. And then the uh, final type would be these risks that emanate from the AI systems themselves. These are more internal or inherent risks from AI systems. And that would um, take the form of rogue AIs, where they have goals separate from our own, and they work against us um, uh, to complete or uh, satisfy their 
their desires or preferences. So uh, overall, there are uh, four, there's malicious use, there's these organizational risks, there's these uh, structural slash environmental risks, and there's these inherent or internal risks in the form of malicious use, organizational risk, uh, uh, racing dynamics, and rogue AIs. Yeah, so if, if we look back maybe 10 years or so, I think most of the discussion about AI risk would have been about rogue AI. So the the risks that are coming from the internally from the AI, so to speak, the AI developing uh, technically in, in ways that we're not interested in. So how much is this categorization setting set in stone? Do, do you think it'll change over time as we learn more or have the field of AI safety matured such that we, we can see the risk landscape now? I think the focus on rogue AI systems is largely due to early movers having substantial cultural influence. I think if we asked other people who were not as invested in AI risks, what if they were to write down um, uh, concerns about these, they would, of course, think that uh, people using the technology for extremely destructive purposes was posed catastrophic risks. And I think the communities um, <clears throat> ended up having some self-selection effects such that uh, People didn't end up talking about things like malicious use and treated that as a distraction, I think. were So I, I think the community didn't um, make much of a space for people who were concerned about things other than um, rogue AI systems. But uh, that was a mistake. The AIs um, being used in malicious ways can definitely cause catastrophes and can um, end up causing uh, it can end up increasing the probability of, of existential risks as well which many people speak about the connections between ongoing harms anticipated risks and catastrophic risks and existential risks uh, I, I think the community of people who were thinking about AI risks a long time ago would largely think about whether there's a direct simple causal pathway to something like an extinction event now, I think we have more of a sophisticated causal understanding of the interplay between these various factors, uh, such that uh, one doesn't try and look for direct mechanisms, um, but instead tries to look at what sort of events uh, increase the probability of existential risk rather than does it directly cause extinction. And that distinction between something that increases probability versus directly cause means that we have to look at a much broader variety of factors. And we can't end up just thinking that all we need to do is make a single very powerful AI agent do what we want, and then everything is solved forever. Unfortunately, uh, we're going to have to treat this as a broader socio-technical problem. We're going to have to uh, consider the various stakeholders, the politics, uh, indeed the the, the geopolitics, uh, um, the relations between different countries, uh, liability laws, and and um, all these other things. Because we're not in this sort of um, foom type of scenario. Uh, it, it would seem, it seems we're more in a slow takeoff. So many of these real world considerations that were sort of uh, sidelined and fused as distractions is actually where most of the action is. What, what would be examples of something that, that might put society in a, in a worse position in or to, where we are less able to, to handle a powerful AI? A prime example would be World War III. If there's World War III, Conditioned on that, that increases the probability of existential risk uh, from AI systems. This would, you know, spur a, a substantial um, AI arms race. We would quickly outsource lethality to them. Um, we would not have nearly as much time for redu uh, making them more aligned and reliable in that process. But still, the competitive pressures would compel uh, different um, states to create um, powerful AI weapons and um, eventually have that take up more and more of their um, more and more of their military force. But that doesn't directly cause extinction. Um, uh, so if we try and back chain from that, it um, it's the, the story gets much more complicated. And so then it's not viewed as uh, it's not viewed in the the scenarios that others were thinking of. There's an AI lab, they've suddenly got a godlike AI, and then it has decisive strategic control over the entire world. What, how will they make sure that it does what they want? That was, I think, the um, scenario that others were thinking largely, and all other ones were um, too broad, too um, intractable. Essentially, there was a focus on, quote unquote, targeted interventions, historically, where we're just a small number of people. We can't do these broad interventions that involve, you know, interfacing with various institutions um, and getting like public support 
uh, those are intractable. So the best we can do is do some very narrow, specific things, maybe technical research. Uh, th this doesn't look like a, a strategy because broad interventions are actually more tractable. The world is interested in this, and we have some amount of time to try and help our institutions uh, make good decisions and policy around these issues. Do you think this, this broader vision of AI safety should make us more positive or less positive? Imagine we have to set all of the institutions up perfectly. It seems like we have a narrow corridor to, to make things right, where the institutions have to be there, the technical side have to work, the, all, all stakeholders have to be set up well for, the, for this to, to, to succeed for us. Should the complexity of the problem make us more pessimistic? Uh, I think it's there's at least more tractability compared to um, an AI suddenly goes from you know incompetent to omnicompetent and in control of the world overnight, and we have no idea it was emergent and we didn't actually control that process. That doesn't have almost any tractability to it. I don't think we need our institutions to be completely perfect. Um, uh, we just need to try and be in the business of reducing risk. So I, maybe that's one other um, conceptual uh, distinction is that historically there'd be a focus on, is it an airtight solution that works in the worst case where uh, if everything, if something goes wrong, then it's, it's insufficient because we have to quote unquote, get it right on the first try. When we do have some amount of time, not saying we have a huge amount of time, we have some amount of time, we can do some course adjustment and incorporate information as we go along. Um, I'm not saying that's a, um, a surefire strategy, um, but I think that's the, the best we have. Um, and it allows us to um, uh, it allows us to um, uh, correct some mistakes, but uh, obviously we can't have much of an much of an error tolerance, unfortunately. Do you think we are missing something with this categorization that, that that you've set up in the paper? Could we be missing some category of risk that will be obvious to us in in, in 20 years? And could, could that risk potentially be the, the most dangerous because we're not anticipating it? Uh, are there are there uh, unknown unknowns here? Well, so usually there are usually there are unknown unknowns. What I, I I focused largely on catastrophic risk and large scale loss of human life. I didn't speak about um, AI well being very much, or for instance, that that's something that could end up changing a lot of how we think about uh, wanting to proceed forward with with um, uh, managing this um, the emergence of of, of digital life. Uh, is if they have moral value. Um, so I think that's um, uh, something I didn't uh, touch on in, in the paper, largely because I think our um, understanding of it is very underdeveloped, and I, I, I still think it's um, a bit too much of a uh, it's it's a bit too much of a taboo topic, such that there just hasn't been much research on it as a consequence. Okay, let's let's dig into the first category of, uh, of risk, which is uh, malicious use. So this is. This is a category in which people, um, bad actors, choose to use AI in, in ways that, that uh, harm humanity. There's, recently, there's been a lot of discussion of, of uh, AIs helping with bioengineered pandemics. Uh, this has been uh, brought up in, in, in the U.S. Uh, Senate, I think, and it's, it's been uh, kind of widely publicized. How, how plausible do you think it is that the current uh, or the next generation of large language models could make it easier to, to create bioengineered uh, viruses. Yeah, so I think that this is actually one of the largest reasons I wrote this paper was because uh, during in 2022, when sort of the development of this paper started, uh, was, this is this bio thing, <laughs> nobody's talking about it. Um, this, uh, although people will treat malicious use as a distraction, I don't think that's the case. Uh, there, are, um, there are catastrophic and existential risks that can come from malicious use. So. And and this threat vector concerns me quite a bit. Um, so uh, I, I think I think it is um, quite plausible that if we have um, an a AI system that has something like a PhD level understanding of virology, then it's fairly straightforward um, that uh, such a system would be um, provide the knowledge for um, synthesizing such a weapon. The risk analysis is something like, what's the number of people with the skill and access to create a, a biological weapon uh, that could be civilization destroying? And um, what's the sort of the probability that they actually want to do that? And right now, you know, maybe there are 30,000 virology PhDs and, you know, they just don't really have the incentive to, to, to do that. Meanwhile, if you have that knowledge 
in available to anybody who wants to go to, you know, use Google's chatbot or Meta's chatbot or um, Bing's or OpenAI's, um, uh, then uh, we can add several zeros to that, uh, to the number of people with the, um, with the skill to pull it off. Because they could just ask such a system, how do I make one? Give me a cookbook. Now, there'd be guardrails, of course, um, but the guardrails are fairly easy to, to overcome because these AI systems can easily be jailbroken. Uh, that's uh, like you can just append some like random garbled string or some adversarially crafted garbled string at the end of your your request to the chat bot. And then that'll take off. It's like safety guardrails as a paper that uh, uh, the uh, uh, center helped with uh, um, uh, uh, in, in uh, creating a, in discussing adversarial attacks for large language models. So now now that's a thing. Or you might use uh, an open source model that's that's available and, and it might also uh, be easily stripped of, of its guardrails. I, I don't think um, a, the AI developers now with the APIs have much of a, um, a high ground as far as like safety goes uh, when it comes to the malicious use case. For other things like hacking, there'd be, be a different story. But um, th that could change. Maybe they'll add more measures. Maybe they'll get better filters. Maybe they will um, remove some bio-related knowledge from the pre-training distribution, uh, and, and so on. Uh, but anyway, um, that would be sufficient for, if, if such a thing were to happen, then there could be a, a pandemic that could um, cause some civilizational discontinuity, which could be some existential risk. Uh, it'd be difficult for it to kill everybody, but for it toppling civilization. Um, and um, it's not clear how that would go or the quality of that situation. That's, that's enough for us to worry, I think. Some of the pushback... Uh to this story of, of a, a bioengineered uh, virus uh, enabled by large language models is that, well, isn't all of the training data freely available online? Couldn't a potential bad actor have, have gone online, gotten the data and, and used it already? What's the difference between using a, a search engine and a large language uh, model? Sure. So um, uh, two things, um, <clears throat> even if there is some type of harmful content online, I don't know why we would want it being propagated. If, we, if the nuclear secrets were online, I don't know why you'd want that propagated, because the, your risk increases based on the ease of access uh, to these. But in the case of bioweapons, yes, there are uh, some bioweapons that are not civilization destroying available online. The ones that would um, be potentially civilization destroying, though, would require a bit more thinking. Um, uh, uh, so you, there could be several, or there could be many people killed as a consequence of these, though, but not at, uh, not at um, you know, a societal scale risk necessarily. Um, so I think that's, that's a, a relevant difference. Uh, many of the um, extremely dangerous pathogens, fortunately, virology people are not writing those up and you know, posting those on Twitter, and then all you got to do is search for them. Uh, this, this isn't, um, uh, that, that's not actually the type of information. For other types of information, like how to, um, tips for breaking the law or how to hot wire a car, you know, this, this sort of stuff is online and uh, generic um, uh, cookbooks for some generic um, smaller scale bioweapons, sure, but not civilization destroying. And how is the, the guide for creating a civilization destroying virus in the large language model if it's not online, in the data online? So I'm, I am not saying that the current ones have this in their capacity. I'm saying that when they have like a PhD level knowledge um, and are able to reflect and, you know, do a bit of brainstorming, um, uh, then, then you're in substantially more trouble. Uh, and, you know, that could possibly be uh, a model on the order of like GPT-5 or 5.5. It may be within its capacity. So there you don't need agent like AI, you would just need a very knowledgeable uh, chatbot uh, uh, for um, that threat, threat to potentially manifest. So there's, there's quite a bit we'll need to do to, um, uh, and in technical research and in, um, uh, and in policy uh, for reducing that specific uh, risk. Another risk you mentioned under malicious use is this issue of AI agents, which they are perhaps a bit analogous to, to viruses. In, in the sense that they might be able to, to, to spread online and uh, replicate themselves and uh, cause harm. Uh, what do you worry about, mo about most with AI agents? I'm, I'm emphasizing, in instance, that there are many forms of malicious use. In this paper, I'm mainly emphasizing ones that could be catastrophic or existential. Uh, so in, in this case, uh, you could imagine people unleashing rogue AI systems 
to just destroy humanity. That could be their objective. And that would be extremely dangerous. So you don't need, you know, you don't need power seeking arguments or these these claims that oh by by default they will have a will to power. Uh, you, you don't need any of that. You just need to assume that uh, if if enough people have access and if some person is um, omnicidal or thinks in the way that some AI scientists do, um, that you know this is we need to bring about the next stage of cosmic evolution and that. Resistance is, is futile, uh, to quote Richard Sutton, the author of the reinforcement learning textbook, and that we should bow out when it behooves us. Um, uh, this, this type of, um, uh, th there are many people who um, uh, would have an inclination for uh, building, not saying Rich Sutton would specifically give the AI system of destroy humanity, but it doesn't seem to say too much against that prospect. Uh, so that, that's another that's another example of mis, uh, malicious use that could be uh, that could be catastrophic or existential. And how close do you think we are to AI agents that actually work? We we had some uh, someone set up uh, Chaos GPT early on uh, when when GPT was was released, but it got stuck in some loops and it, it couldn't actually do anything, even if it w was imbued with bad motives. When would you expect uh, agents to to actually be be capable and therefore dangerous? Yeah, so I think that their capability would be a continuous thing in the same way. Like, when are they good at generating text? It's like, well, you know, it kind of started in GPT two, GPT three, and so um, so I, I might anticipate um, uh, uh, great strides in uh, AI agents next year, where we can give it some basic um, uh, short uh, tasks, um, uh, and, like. You know, um, uh, help me make this like PowerPoint or something. It's not going to do the whole thing, but um, uh, it can help with uh, things like that or browsing around on the the internet for you more. Um, uh, so I think those capabilities will um, keep coming. Um, for it to pose a substantial risk, um, uh, there's a variety of things it could do. Um, uh, it could threaten, for instance, mutually assured destruction with humanity by saying, I will make this bioweapon that will destroy all of you and I'll take you down with me unless you, you know, comply with some types of demands. Uh, that, that could work. If they're good at hacking, um, then they could potentially amass a lot of resources by um, uh, uh, scamming people or by stealing cryptocurrency. Uh, there's, there's a, um, uh, a variety. They could, of course, tap into lots of different uh, sensors um, uh, to uh, manipulate people or influence uh, public discourse. Um, uh, uh, they wouldn't necessarily need to be embodied uh, for this type of thing to happen. Uh, if we're if we're in a later stage of AI development where we have a lot of weaponized AI systems, and then hacking those systems would of course be uh, substantially more concerning. Or if they um, or if those systems get repurposed maliciously to um, weaponized AI systems, so it's it's um it becomes a lot easier as time progresses. The AIs don't need to be particularly power seeking on this view, though. To um, uh, to have this potential for catastrophe because humanity will basically give them that power by default. Um, uh, they will keep weaponizing them. They will integrate them into more and more critical decisions. Um, uh, they will um, uh, let them uh, uh, move around money and complete uh, transactions, and um, uh, they'll give them a looser and looser leash. So uh, uh, as time goes on, the potential for rogue AI or for Deliberately, AI systems that are deliberately instructed to cause harm uh, would be uh, uh, would in, in the potential impact uh, or severity would keep increasing. Yeah, I think maybe it's it's, it's worth mentioning here just the uh, the continuous costs of traditional uh, computer viruses, which are costly and which we we don't have. Uh, we we've gotten better at handling those as a as a civilization, but we still haven't defeated. Uh, traditional or conventional viruses which are very dumb compared to uh what a what ai agents could be so so we could imagine we can imagine a computer virus equipped with more intelligence and you know how would how would you as a person i'm not saying ai agents will will be necessarily as smart as people uh soon but uh, how would you do the kind of hacking that that the agent might be interested in it's interesting to consider at least that that we haven't been able to squash out conventional viruses Mm -hmm. Yeah, they could they could exfiltrate their information onto different servers or like less protected ones, uh, and then use those to um, proliferate themselves even further. Uh, so um, there'll be a very um, a very um, distinct adversary 
with um, many, many um, options at their disposal for causing harm. Yeah, one, one thing I worry about is whether the tools and techniques we'll need at, at, a, at an institutional level to handle malicious use will also enable governments to become uh, totalitarian, basically, to, to, ha- to exercise too great a, a, a level of control over citizens who have done nothing wrong. So what is required to prevent the large language models that, that could become AI agents and could be used to create viruses? What, what, what techniques are available for, for preventing them uh, being used in such ways without uh, enabling kind of too much state power? Yeah, I think this is, this is definitely a tension where to counteract these risks from rogue, lone wolf actors, then people would want the technology centralized. Um, you know, as, I mean, this would be a similar issue with nuclear weapons, for instance, where um, we didn't want everybody being able to make nuclear weapons. So we wanted to keep control of uranium. And um, so what happened was we you know, had a no first use plus nonproliferation um, regime. And um, that kept the power in a, a, a few different um, uh, people's hands. I think there are things we could do to reduce these sorts of risks uh, by creating institutions that are more democratic. I think that seems useful. I think decoupling the organizations that, are, uh, that has some of the most powerful AI systems, having those more decoupled from um, the uh, militaries uh, would be fairly useful so that if something goes out of, gets out of hand with one, if, if, they're, if they're linked, and if we're needing to pull the plug on these AI systems, this isn't like taking down the military. I think just separating this sort of uh, cognitive labor and um, or labor generally, automated labor from uh, a physical force uh, would be uh, fairly useful. Um, but I think largely it's creating democratic, uh, democratic institutions is, is one of these measures. In the case of dealing with rogue AIs that are uh, people maliciously instructed rogue AIs uh, that are proliferating across the internet, I think there'd be other types of things like legal liability laws for liability laws for um, for cloud providers that if you are running um, a an unverified or um, unsafe um, AI system on your cloud um, or on your compute, then you get in trouble. Uh, This would create incentives for them to keep track of it instead of just doling out compute to whoever's paying. Uh, So that's sort of like having an incentive for off switches uh, all over. So uh, there's, there's, there's a, um, there's a variety of different things we, we could be doing to, um, to strike this balance um, by reducing these malicious use risks. I mean, also, I should mention some of these malicious users don't require this type of centralization um, or at nearly as much. We can do various things to reduce this risk without um, giving tons of power to, to states. For instance, if we uh, invest in personal protective equipment or um, monitoring, uh, monitoring waterways for early signs of uh, some pathogens. I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's the traditional stuff we can do to reduce risks from pandemics, for instance, which would reduce our risks, uh, our exposure to the risk of uh, AI facilitated uh, pandemics. So uh, not all interventions for reducing malicious use uh, require uh, more centralization. I I, I would imagine that we probably wouldn't want in the long term, like say it's like 2040 or something like that, we wouldn't want anybody anywhere being able just to ask their AI system how to make a pandemic or being able to unleash it to try and take over the world. Um, This doesn't seem um, like a good idea There'd be other types of things like structured access, where for these bio capabilities, you just give people who are doing medical research access to those specific bio capabilities. But other people, they don't really have much of a reason for it, so they don't get that advanced, uh, they don't get models with that advanced knowledge. So I think there are some simple restrictions that we can do that uh, can take care of a large chunk of the risk without needing to um, hand over the technology to like militaries, and then they're the only ones who have it. You mentioned legal liabilities for, for cloud providers um, and, and maybe companies in general. I wonder if this uh, might be a way to have a form of uh, decentralized uh, control over, over, um, over AI agents or over large language models or generative models, AI in general, by having the, the state provide a framework for uh, 
where you can get fined for for trespassing some boundaries, but then having companies uh, implement exactly how that works, use technical tools in order to reduce their risk of fines and uh, maybe we can find a, a a good balance there where, where we weigh the the costs and and benefits. I, I think that uh, liability laws help um, fix the problem of externalities quite a bit, uh, where they're imposing risks on others that um, are uh, that have no that sh- shouldn't shouldn't have any risk imposed on them because they're not um, privy to the the decisions or they're they're. There's there's an issue with that though, which is that there's only so many externalities that some of these organizations could internalize though with liability law. If somebody creates a pandemic as a consequence of their AI system, you could sue that company, but they're they're not going to be able to pay off the, the destruction of civilization with their, their capital. So there's there's quite a limit to it. It can it can help fix the incentives, but it still doesn't um it doesn't fix them entirely because it's not particularly um one certainly can't internalize like downfall of like civilization as an organization um, and like foot the bill for that. Um, and then the extinction of uh, the human race is also, I don't think, uh, a, a thing you could settle in court. So what about requiring insurance? Uh, so this is an idea that has been discussed for um, advanced uh, biological research, uh, gain of function research with viruses, for example. Maybe such a thing could also work for risky experiments with advanced AI? Yeah, it depends if the harms are localized. Uh, I think insurance and this taming of typical, not long tail, not black swan type of uncertainty, but thin tailed uh, type of uncertainty uh, makes sense when risks are more localized. But when we are um, dealing with risks that are scalable um, uh, and can bring down the entire system, um, uh, then uh, I, I think uh, a lot of the um, incentives for insurance don't make as much sense. So you need you basically need like um, some law of large numbers and many types of insurance to like kick in um, to sort of um, to have that risk diversified away. But if the ris- the entire system has exposure to that risk, it's you can't there's not there's not another system to diversify. It. Maybe you could paint us a picture of a, a positive vision here. So say we get to 2050 and we've worked this out. What does the world look like in a world where we control malicious uh, AI? I think if people have access to these these AI systems, they're subject to uh, and they have many uh, of their capabilities. There are, of course, restrictions on them, like you can't use them to to break the law. Um, so a lot of these most dangerous capabilities, nobody's really able to to use them in that way. Um, if there is a need for um, in the case of like defense, um, they would end up using like AIs for things like hacking and, and whatnot. And that would. Um, uh, like they would have access to that type of technology, but uh, it wouldn't be the case that any you know, uh, angsty teenager can just download a model online and then they instruct it to you know take down some critical infrastructure. This just isn't a, a possibility. Uh, I, it's it's very much trying to strike a balance with that. I would hope that we would also have these most powerful AI systems that do carry more of this uh, force um, that have some of these more dangerous capabilities are um, subject to democratic control. So that uh, power is 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 not as uh, is not as centralized, and that also I think reduces like the risk of like quote unquote uh, like lock in uh, risks as well, where some individual group can impose their um, values and and entrench them. Uh, so um, it's, it's at least those are some properties of a of a uh, positive future. Uh, um, so I don't think it looks like complete mass proliferation of of extremely dangerous AI products. Um, and I don't think it looks like um, only one group, one, you know, elite aristocrat group gets to make the decisions for humanity's I- humanity either. Um, so uh, there's uh, different levels of access to different levels of lethality, depending on um, and, and power, depending on um, whether it makes sense. Um, but the highest level institutions are still um, democratic. Another category of risks that you discuss is the, the possibility of an AI race. Uh, now, we, we've done another episode where we, where we talked about evolutionary pressures and how they, uh, how they work uh, between corporations and how they might uh, lead to a situation in which humanity is, is gradually disempowered. But I think one thing we could discuss here in this episode is the possibility of a military AI race. What do, you, what do you think a military AI race looks like? 
to uh, recap, we were just at the malicious use one. And so now the other risk category would be like racing dynamics or competitive pressures or collective action problems. This is that structural environmental risk that when we were referring to the categories way earlier. Uh, yeah, I think the with the, the corporate race, obviously, there's, as, as we discussed in the previous episode, there's, you know, them cutting corners on safety. And this is large what AI development is driven by. A lot of these organizations will start as having a very strong safety bent. But then they're basically going to um, uh, be pressured into just racing and prioritizing the profit and developing these things as quickly as possible and staying competitive over their safety. This is sort of the, the dynamic that basically drives pretty much all these AI companies. And I don't think actually in the presence of these intense competitive pressures that intentions particularly matter. So I think, I think basically this is the main force to look at when trying to explain the major developments of AI. Why are companies acting the way they are? Uh, it can be very well approximated by uh, uh, by them um, just trying to uh, by them succumbing to competitive pressures um, or defecting in this broader collective action problem of should we slow down and should we um, proceed more prudently and invest more in safety and try and make sure our institutions are caught up or should we race ahead so that way uh, so that way we can um, continue um, being in the lead because one day we'll maybe be more responsible with this technology. Uh, I'm concerned, as mentioned in that previous episode, of that leading us to like a state of substantial dependence um, and l- losing effective control. You can imagine a similar dynamic happening with the military. Uh, j- just like if we don't want, uh, you know, arrows, for instance, you're not going to roll back arrows. And so when you start going down the road of um, of uh, weaponizing AI systems, if they're more potent and cheaper and more generally capable and more politically convenient than sending um, human uh, soldiers onto the battlefield. Uh, then um, uh, this in this uh, becomes a very difficult process to reverse back. Eventually, what happens is you've had an on ramp to many more potential catastrophic risks. You've transferred much of the lethal power, in fact, the main sources of lethal power, to AI systems, and then you're hoping that they're reliable enough and that you've sufficiently you can keep them under sufficient control and that they can do your bidding. Even if you do um, get them highly reliable and they do what you instruct them to do, uh, this doesn't make people overall very safe. We saw with the Cuban Missile Crisis, we, we can definitely, nu- nukes don't turn on us. They don't you know, go off and pursue their own goals or something like that. They, they do what we, <laughs> what we um, uh, uh, want them to do. But collectively, due to this structural, environmental, um, game theoretic situation where like, well, we would all be better off without nuclear weapons. but we it makes sense for us each individually to stockpile um, them. We put the broader world at larger collective risk. So, like in the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, JFK said we had up to like a half um, or like a fifty percent chance of extinction in that event. It was a very close call because the we we almost got a nuclear exchange with that. And likewise with AI systems, they may be more powerful. They may be better at facilitating the development of new weapons too. And this could um, uh, also um, bring us at a risk where, uh, bring us in a situation where we could potentially uh, destroy ourselves um, uh, again. Um, what, what's pernicious about this, this, this um, structural or environmental um, constraint where we've got different um, parties, um, in this case, militaries, competing against each other is, is the following. Even if we convince the world that like, the existential risk from AI is like 5% because let's say they're not reliable. Um, we, we can't reliably control them. So maybe there's a 5% chance they like turn on us or we lose control of them and then we become you know, a second class species or exterminate. Even if that's the case, it may make sense for these militaries to go along with it. Just like, we, they, I mean, they swallowed the risk of, um, of potential nuclear Armageddon by creating um, these, these nuclear weapons in the first place. But they thought if we don't create these nuclear weapons, then we will certainly be destroyed. So there's certainty of destruction versus, you know, a, and a, a small chance of destruction. And I think they'd be willing to make that trade off. So this is how um, there could be an existential risk to all of humanity based on these, these structural conditions. Even So it's not enough to convince the world that existential risk is high because they might just, OK, well, yeah, that's, that's you know, 5%. OK, we're going to have to go with that Russian roulette thing. It makes rational sense for us to to um, engage in this um, what would normally be very risky behavior because we don't have a better choice. So um, this is why I don't think it makes sense just to hammer home the point that, wow, these AIs could, could turn on us or we could lose control of them. 
uh, there's this structural thing of like, that's not going to matter unless that probability is like very high. Like maybe if it's like 30% and they go, okay, all right, we're not going to build the thing because, uh, but if, it, if it's something like 5%, uh, they might go through with it anyway. So more than just um, uh, concerns about single AI agents make sense or it makes sense to focus on. We have to focus on these multi-agent dynamics, these, these competitive pressures, the, the sort of the game theory of, of what they're, they're um, facing. And um, I, I, so I, I think that if you don't resolve that, you're basically exposed to insensitivity to a lot of existential risk up to, um, up to maybe 5 or 10%. Um, which maybe it isn't, it's, it's, it's possible. Maybe it's actually only 2%. Uh, the, and where you convince the world, everybody's very educated about it. Every, everybody listens to Future of Life podcast tomorrow and they all go, wow, this is a concern. I am updated 5%. Won't matter. Um, it won't stop that type of dynamic from happening. So you have to fix the international coordination issue. You have to avoid this sort of potential for World War III thing. Now, it didn't directly cause it, <laughs> as we were discussing earlier, um, this wasn't a direct cause of extinction, but it increased the probability substantially. That's the sort of framing we have to focus on in trying to reduce existential risk, not search for direct causal mechanisms, but look at these diffuse effects and structural conditions. Yeah, so concretely, this might look like uh, the U.S. is considering implementing AI systems into their nuclear co command and control systems. So specifically, they're, they're doing this to uh, to counteract the rumors of other countries doing the same thing. And in order to act quickly enough with their nuclear weapons, they, they think they need to, 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 to give uh, AI a greater degree of, of control over, over, uh, over these nuclear weapons. And so you have a, a, a situation in which countries are, are responding to, to the actions of, of each other uh, in, a, in, an, in a way that accelerates uh, risks uh, from both sides, in a, in a sense. There'd be one. I mean, there are other ways this can uh, affect the the uh, affect warfare. It could um, it could um, uh, maybe be better at doing anomaly detection, thereby identify nuclear submarines and you know affect the, the nuclear triad that way. Um, or we uh, in later stages just have massive fleets of, of of AI. And this is saying robots. Sorry to say, but like later stage, um, uh, if they're much cheaper to produce, uh, they'd be very good combatants. We do, there isn't skin in the game. Um, this increases the, uh, this makes it more feasible to get into conflict. There are other ways in which this increases the probability of conflict too. There's more uncertainty about where your competitors are what, relative to you. Maybe they had an algorithmic breakthrough. Maybe they could actually catch up um, really quickly or surpass us by finding some algorithmic breakthrough. This creates severe or extreme uncertainty about the capabilities profile of adversaries. Uh, this, this lack of information about that uh, it increases the, the, uh, the, the chance of, of conflict as well. It may also increase first strike advantage substantially too, um, which would also increase the probability of, uh, of conflict. Um, like we have an AI system today, it's much more powerful than anything else. They might get theirs tomorrow. If we act today, then we can squash them. Uh, and, and that could um, uh, get, get, the, get the ball rolling for um, some uh, all global catastrophe. So yeah, pretty, pretty, um, uh, pretty pernicious uh, dynamics um, overall. Um, but all of these can be viewed as competitive pressures driving AI systems end up propagating um, um, throughout all aspects of life. We mentioned through the, the, um, uh, the, the public sphere, in the economy, people's private lives with AI chatbots, also in defense, in the military. It just basically becomes um, everywhere and we end up relying more and more on them to make these sorts of decisions. And I don't think in many of these, we become um, so dependent on them that uh, things move quickly. We can't actually keep up. We can't make, if we're actually making these decisions, we'll make much worse decisions. So then they basically become ineffective control. Um, things also move so quickly that the answer to our AI problems is we need to bring in more AIs because since they're using more AIs, now we need to use more AIs. And so it creates a self-reinforcing feedback loop, which ends up eroding our um, overall influence and, and oversight as to what's going on. And so I think that's the default one. So of these sort of risk categories, I think this seems like um, straightforwardly the case if we don't fix like international coordination and if it's like a if there's a close competition between countries or if we don't um, uh, fix the, the uh, racing dynamics in the, um, in the corporate sphere, uh, then I think um, uh, it's uh, fairly likely that uh, humanity becomes at least like uh, a second class species loses control from there. Eventually, probably they go extinct, but that might be a long time after. But uh, uh, um, uh, so th this is the um, uh, main risk that 
uh, I'm worried about, but you know, as director of Central Various AD, I'll try and be ecumenical and focus on um, various others too. Um, so I'm always making sure there are projects addressing each of these though, but personally, this is the one that I'm most concerned about. So treaties between governments and some form of collaboration between the top AI corporations, is, is, is that the way out here? How do we mitigate this risk? It seems, uh, the way you describe it, it seems very difficult to avoid given that given the incentives, basically. People respond to incentives, uh, they rationally respond to incentives. And so for each step along the way, they they have reasons to do what they're doing. And so it's, it seems difficult to avoid. What are our options? Well, uh, there's... You know, th- th- there are positive signs, for instance, like Henry Kissinger was recently suggesting in foreign affairs that the U.S. cooperate with China on this issue now, um, uh, but before it's too late. So I, I think some people are recognizing the, um, uh, the the importance of trying to do something about this. There's uh, it's, it's possible there'd be some clarifications about antitrust law, which would make it possible for AI companies to not engage in excessive competition over this and put the uh, uh, whole world at risk. Um, potentially, there could be an international institution like a uh, CERN for AI, um, which is the default um, uh, organization, um, which is a, has a, a broad a consortium or coalition of, of, of countries uh, providing input to that um, and helping steer it. One that's maybe decoupled from, uh, to some extent, of, of, of militaries. Um, uh, so that we're not having too much power centralized in one place. So it doesn't have a monopoly on violence and eventually after it automates a lot, a monopoly on labor. I think that's just like basically all the power uh, in the world. So those are possibilities. I think that the time window might be a bit shorter, though. Um, if the if there's an arms race, an AI arms race in the military, and if the AI is viewed as like the main thing to be competing on, like we need to spend a trillion dollars, you know, we'll spend you know, on that order for, you know, nuclear weapons. Um, if, if when that becomes the case, I think it's where we're very much set down that that path, and then we're exposed to um, uh, uh, very substantial risks. So, uh, so yeah, I think we maybe we'll have a sense in the, in the next uh, uh, few years as to whether we get some type of coordination, or if we are not going to recognize that we're all in the same boat as humans, and we don't want this to happen. But we'll need people to basically understand what happens if we go down this route, and if we don't try and ch- fix the the payoff matrix, the incentives uh, at the outset, the the, the structure. Um, uh, that these players find themselves in or that these developers find themselves in. That looks like a, very much a political problem uh, as it happens. Uh, so this is why it, making reducing AI X risk and whatnot and making AI safe is a socio-technical problem. Um, it's not writing down an eight-page mathematical you know, solution, you know, work of genius, and then, oh, okay, we can all go home now and everything's taken care of. It's not going to look like that. Um, that was a, a category error in understanding how to reduce this risk. Uh, we we shouldn't have these types of like founders effects uh, have like undue influence over like it will keep lingering. I think that will eventually like go away, but I still think it's still like lingering. And I think we should just like move past it and recognize the complexity of the situation. There. Let's talk about organizational risks. Uh, and this these these risk categories, of course, kind of play into each other, influence each other. So if we have if we have organizations that are acting in a, in a risky way, that this uh, this increases the risk of potentially rogue AI, or it incentivizes others to 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 race in order to compete with these uh, organizations that are that are a- a- acting um, in risky ways. But yeah, let's just take it from the beginning. What what falls under the organizational risks uh, category? Yeah, so organizational risks at a slightly more abstract level would be the the accidents bucket. Uh, so even if we um, reduce competitive pressures and um, uh, if we have a um, uh, and if we don't have to worry about um, malicious use immediately, um, we'd still have the issue of organizations having you know maybe a culture of move fast and break things or them not having a safety culture. In, in other industries or for other technologies, like rockets, you know, there wasn't um, extreme competition with that, but nonetheless, rockets would blow up um, or nuclear power plants would melt down. Acts, catastrophic accidents can still happen. And these can be um, very deadly in the case of, of AI systems eventually. So I, I think this is a, um, 
Uh, this is a, definitely a very hard one to fix. Most of the people at these AI organizations and how they were initialized and whatnot still had a lot of people who are most, mostly just wanting to build it and you know the, 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 the consequences to society be damned. Um, this is not my wheelhouse. I don't read the news. I don't like thinking about this sort of stuff. It's just these annoying humanities majors and whatnot who are in these you know, ethics divisions or policy divisions that uh, keep, keep annoying us. This is kind of the, the, the attitude at, at, most of these, uh, at most of these companies by and large. And um, uh, uh, I think this is a, uh, um, a, a large source of risk. We could, um, as well as um, it's, it's just non-trivial, as we see in other, other, thing, in other things like nuclear power plants, chemical plants, um, rockets, in, in making sure that these, um, this is all uh, extremely reliable. So uh, we'd need various precedents. There's basically a literature on this called the organizational safety literature, um, which, which focuses on um, uh, various uh, various corporate controls and processes for uh, making sure that the organization responds to failure, um, takes near misses seriously, has good whistleblowing, has good internal risk management um, regimes, uh, has like a, ch a chief risk officer or an internal audit committee, all these sorts of things to um, to reduce these types of risks. And yeah, you were right in that this interacts with not necessarily direct cause of some of these existential risks, but it nonetheless boosts up the probability if we're perceiving that an organization um, is very reckless in its attitude. This causes more safety-minded ones to um, compete harder um, and and justify uh, justify erasing. This reduces the um, <clears throat> that consequently reduces the amount of time you have to work on control and reliability of these AI systems, uh, which uh, affects the probability of of um, rogue AIs. Of course, there's also other types of accidents that could happen, like. Um, the organization might accidentally leak the model, um, leak one of its models that has some lethal capabilities in it if, um, if it's repurposed. There's also a risk of, um, as, as you know, potentially, who's to say, uh, happened with, uh, um, uh, with, with viruses, maybe there'd be some unfortunate gain of function research that would also uh, lead to some type of catastrophe uh, as well. There are people uh, interested in what is uh, essentially gain of function research and in creating warning shots, they might be a little too successful uh, later on. What does gain of function research look like in AI? Deliberately building some AI system that's like power seeking or Machiavellian and wants to destroy humanity, and then they're going to use this to like you know scare the world with. But like <laughs> at at some point, um, uh, when it's powerful enough, you might get what you asked for. The idea here is to create a a dangerous AI, maybe an AI that's more agentic or power seeking, and then use that model to study how to contain it. But then the worry is that uh, we could ironically go instinct, perhaps, because we, we, can't, uh, we can't control uh, the, the, the model. Yeah. And if this is like, who, who's to say who's going to be experimenting with this or how exactly cautious they will be or their like, skill level, um, it may be mandated that they test for um, these types of dangerous inclinations or capabilities. Um, and who exactly is going to be doing that is, is unclear. It may not be like the, the most like uh, uh, capable people um, uh, or there's just some um, overall or there's just some risk of, of, of accidents in that way. Um, so I guess that, that gives some, some flavor of some of the direct accidents, but I also think how it indirectly affects things is. So one way in which it, I think strongly indirectly affects things is um, it what accident is an intellectual error inside of these organizations where they uh, conflate safety and capabilities. This is a very common thing um, where there's not clear thinking about safety and capabilities, uh, where people be, oh, well, we're, we're smart, you know, rationalists and justify the means. Um, uh, we're risk neutral. Um, we actually have, have, don't actually do much empirical deep learning research, but conceptually, um, we think that this will be beneficial for safety, even though it will come at the cost of capabilities and whatnot. So they really uh, muddied up that line. Um, and um, uh, the distinction between safety and capabilities such that you could imagine a lot of these safety efforts uh, basically just working on capabilities the entire time. Um, I think that's um, a reasonable fraction of the sort of safety teams, I think, do focus just on, on capabilities. For, for context, um, there is an extreme <coughs> correlation between AI's capabilities in various different subjects and, and goals. So if you want your AI system to be better at something like math problems or history problems or accounting problems, 
these are all these capabilities are all extremely correlated now we can see with like large language models you should assume that if something is correlated like the, the correlation is like like uh, 80% or like 90% it's 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 extremely high um <clears throat> so when people reason themselves into um some new capability that they think will be helpful for safety uh, it's very likely the base rate of it being correlated with with capabilities and basically being nearly identical um, to other capabilities by being so correlated is um, uh, is extremely high. So I think there needs to be substantial evidence that the safety intervention that one is applying isn't affecting the general capabilities, and that requires empirical evidence. So a good example of um, empirical research that I think helps with safety but doesn't clearly help with general capabilities of making a system smarter would be like the, the area of machine unlearning. So machine unlearning is where you're trying to unlearn some specific dangerous capabilities, trying to unlearn bio knowledge, trying to unlearn specific know-how that allows you to hack. This is more clearly like measurably not correlated with, it's anti-correlated with some capabilities and not particularly correlated with general capabilities if you're just removing that specific know-how. Adversarial robustness is also generally anti-correlated with general capabilities. It doesn't make the systems overall smarter. What happens is it makes the systems robust to some specific types of attacks. Robustness to that comes at a fairly large computational cost and takes up a lot of the model capacity. Uh, but that would be a sort of that would be a safety intervention that doesn't uh, make the models overall smarter. So those are examples of, or I suppose another example would be with transparency research. Um, <clears throat> historically, uh, there have been no instances of transparency advancements leading to um, general capabilities advancements. Uh, just trying to understand what's going on in the model, and it doesn't really work nearly as well as just like throwing more data at it. Um, and um, there aren't many architectural improvements that are likely to be found anyway um, uh, as a result of these investigations, is the track record is pretty basically completely clean for transparency. Now, maybe that wouldn't be the case in the future, but then at that point, then we wouldn't identify this as something that is particularly helping with safety. Uh, so I think that for the safety research areas, we need to be quite clear about there's, it's not, there's, you can't just have some informal argument about uh, or an appeal to authority that, oh, this is helpful for safety because of you know, the, some, some, uh, some, some verbal argument. The em empirical machine learning is very complicated. Hindsight barely works in trying to understand what's going on. Why does pre-training on fractal images help improve robustness to, uh, I don't know, basically everything and improve the calibration and anomaly detection performance? I have no idea. Um, it works though. Even yeah, ask people like, why are activation functions the, the way they are? Uh, I don't think there's actually a good canonical explanation that's like very consistent. You would want empirical evidence that when we are engaging in safety research, we are not accidentally also increasing the capabilities of models. And, and you think this is something that, that happens often? Yeah, I think this happens extremely often in this sort of this organizational risk of the conflation of safety and capabilities. Now, this isn't to say that they are loose and separate. A better improvements in capabilities has downstream effects on safety in many situations. It makes them better able to understand um, human values, for instance, as they gain more and more common sense. Uh, but if we are trying to improve safety and specifically reduce existential risk, I think we need to differentially improve on some safety access and not in the general capabilities access. If we are doing something that's fairly correlated with capabilities and safety, I think that the, the, the default expectation is that actually you're working in uh, you're working in the service of um, capabilities. A good example would be um, one of OpenAI's strategies to um, mention this specifically, because I just don't think it's particularly intellectually defensible, as sorry to say, uh, you know, we're disagreeable individuals, so here I go. Um, uh, I don't think building a superhuman alignment researcher specifically just affects alignment. I think such a thing can be easily repurposed to doing lots of other types of research. I don't think there's like a specific alignment research skill set that is just, oh, it's just, you're only good at that, but if, if you're good at that, it means nothing about your ability to accomplish anything else. I just don't think that's the case. I think it's, it's actually extremely correlated with general capabilities. It would be very straightforwardly repurposed to other forms of research. Um, but that's an example of this sort of conflation. Now, this isn't to say OpenAI is doing, uh, is, is only is conflating safety and capabilities entirely. I'm not claiming that. They will have some work on transparency, um, I, I gather that they'll work more on reliability and, and robustness, 
But um, uh, this is a, uh, a very uh, dangerous conflation. And I think basically if, they're, if they seem kind of correlated um, just intuitively, and then if you hear a lot of verbal arguments without empirical demonstration, you basically assume just the base rates are like a lot of these completely separate subjects, like performance in history and like performance in philosophy and mathematics, like th those are all like hyper correlated to assume this other type of thing is also hyper correlated with it too. Anyway, though, that's another one that like uh, an organizational factor that really reduces the um, amount of time we have to solve this problem um, and our ability to solve it as well. So, yeah, I, I think the worry here for say you're a, you're a top AI company and you're thinking, OK, how much a safe organization features should we implement? So, so should we have more red teaming? Should we have more procedures, more review, more a testing uh, should we have should we require this empirical evidence before we begin a new a new uh, safety research uh, program this now threatens uh, to to make to slow us down and to to it opens up uh, it opens us up to competition from the kind of scrappy new startup that's that's uh, on at our heels uh, trying to trying to outcompete us this is very straightforwardly now a, a case of, of a kind of AI race undermining organizational uh, safety, or at least threatening to undermine organizational safety. C can, you, can you make an argument if, you're, if you were to, to, to sell this to, to a, a CEO of, of an AI corporation that... When would I be in that situation? <laughs> <laughs> that safety is in the interest of, of, uh, of the organization itself. You could say uh, it's, it's difficult to sell... Uh, unsafe products, right? You want to be in control. You don't want to lose your the weights of your model in a leak and so on. So there, there, there might be some correlation between the self-interest of, of the organization and the interest that society has in safety in, in general. But before that, one, one factor, an additional factor that just like diffusely increases probability of extras from like these organizations, if, if they just do safety washing and they don't even know it sometimes, they might have some like small gesture for safety. They might have a a, for instance, a responsible scaling policy that doesn't commit them to almost anything, and then that placates um, regulators, for instance, and but doesn't doesn't actually reduce risk. Those would be other examples of um, of how organizational risks can uh, end up increasing the probability of like existential risk. Although it's diffuse and indirect, it still matters. Uh, on the self interest point. I think um, a lot of the catastrophic risks uh, or the catastrophic risks and existential risks are, are tail risks. And generally, organizations don't really price in tail risks that much. Um, a lot of portfolios don't really do much to address uh, tail risks either, like in other industries, like in, in, in finance and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> so it's sort of this is kind of like a problem with our in, many of our institutions that a lot of, we, we could convince them to do things like red teaming to some extent, but doing red teaming for uh, existential risks and whatnot is not necessarily something that they would check to do because that's not going to affect their product tomorrow. Um, there's no, there's no uh, pushback if everybody is dead, as, as mentioned before. So uh, I think that this works to a limit. I think some things like uh, saying information security for your company uh, or so that your uh, weights don't leak, this is a much easier argument to make. Um, other claims like uh, some of these uh, internal controls and whatnot. Uh, oh, this will slow us down. This will um, this will reduce our velocity. And I think these are are harder to make. And I don't think that there are necessarily short term economic incentives for some of these. Many of these are actually more for addressing tail risks and um, and black swan events. Um, so they would then need to just recognize that the black swan events are. Uh, real possibilities beyond a probability threshold worth actually addressing. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm not claiming that they're being completely irrational if they're having, um, uh, if they're being fairly short-sighted and, um, uh, and don't believe in these black swan events from it. Then I think them trying to maintain velocity and just maintain optionality and whatnot, it's, it's, it's understandable. I wouldn't advocate for that, but it's understandable uh, that they're doing that. I think they're um, comporting to a lot of their incentives um, well, uh, but, and they will do various things to reduce uh, some generic risk. They will do some generic forms of red teaming, regardless of whether there's regulation, because it will make sense. But I just don't think that that does particularly much in the way of reducing these catastrophic or existential risks off. Say you're a philanthropist or a government with a, a big bag of money, and you want to incentivize safety research at, at these uh, top AI 
corporations. Is, is there a way in which you could earmark the money and make sure it's spent on what you, you want it to be spent on? So it's not funneled into increasing capabilities of, of the models. It's spent on the right type of, of safety research. I, I think that'd be one intervention. I think it's very possible to, um, there are a lot of um, professors lying around in academe who could do this research. All you need is to subsidize. So for instance, like the Center for Air Safety has a compute cluster. We'd love to expand it. Um, we're only able to support not, not that many um, professors to do uh, research with large language models and very compute intensive experiments. But there are a lot of, uh, a lot of professors who um, uh, could be doing more research here. So I think that probably, there aren't that many people working at these organizations, I should say as well. And uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on them um, to fix everything. You're actually just correlating it with like, what is Jared Kaplan's safety vision? What is Jan Lake's safety vision? And like, you're, you're expo- you're getting like two or three bets if you were like, giving, you know, each of them money. And uh, I think that's not a very diversified portfolio and you should expect blind spots just because uh, people aren't, don't have, can't simulate a collective intelligence, a broad research effort um, uh, by themselves, even if they work very hard and have lots of discussions and are, you know, take out, have good deference to outside views and so on. They just can't, they just can't simulate that function. Um, So I would suggest if one's wanting to subsidize um, safety research, we can, if there's, can have uh, subsidized like a compute cluster, and then we can have high accountability of like you're not allowed to run this project because this doesn't seem sufficiently safety related. Um, instead of giving like money, you no know, strings attached to some academics, and they run off with it. Um, so that would be my uh, preferred intervention. Um, and I think that there's uh, it can take orders of magnitude more. So like if any of them are listening, you know, like reach out to us. I'd love to <laughs> give more compute to uh, to um, uh, people doing relevant. Uh, uh, doing relevant research um, uh, on safety in a, in a nice diversified portfolio uh, across transparency and adversarial robustness and backdoors and machine learning models uh, uh, and unlearning, um, uh, these types of topics. Do you think some safety breakthroughs uh, would be kept secret? Say, say a safety uh, breakthrough at, at Google DeepMind made the AI uh, useful or uh, in, in a way that, that incentivized them not to share the safety breakthrough? Or do, would you expect safety breakthroughs to be shared widely as, as if they were uh, found in, in an academic lab? I think for market positioning, one of them could occupy the niche of being the safest of the racing companies. We are technically the safest. Um, so I think that's um, currently occupied by Anthropic, and this might make it fairly useful when pitching themselves for, say, a defense contract that, look, we're the more reliable organization um, compared to our competitors. And so if they would be open sourcing some of that, then I think they would lose um, some of that competitive advantage. So it, it, it's quite conceivable that um, they'd hold on to um, hold on to things. I mean, there's many safety projects they do for which the code is not like open source. Uh, right? So we see that to some extent there. But I, I think it can make sense for uh, one of them to try and just be a bit safer than the others or a bit more reliable than the others. Yeah, I, I've heard uh, Sam Altman, the, the CEO of, of OpenAI, talk about releasing these systems, so specifically releasing GPT-3 uh, and, and 4 to the world, chat GPT, in order to gather more attention to the issue. Do, do you think this is a viable strategy? Is this too risky or, or is it uh, worth trying? I think um, to answer a more extreme question to possibly get a sense of my position on this, I think the release of Llama 2, for instance, by Meta, which is an open source, large language model around the capacity of GPT 3.5, I think the the um, benefits of that actually outweigh the costs. Um, uh, it enables a lot more research. Um, it also improves our defenses um, uh, against some of the immediate applications of these AI systems. So for instance, um, it came out uh, today that uh, North Korea is using some of these AI systems. I don't know whether it's Llama 2. That'd be my guess because uh, it's just among the, it's the most capable open source system or, or Code Llama potentially using AI systems to identify vulnerabilities in software. And then that helps them shortlist things to to attack. This isn't an extremely capable uh, or this doesn't you know rewrite the cost benefit analysis of cyber attacks. It doesn't um, uh, rupture our digital ecosystem. Um, but this basically gives us some um, preview and forces um, these these issues on um, uh, people's attention. Uh, so um, I, I think there's an I think there's an argument to be made for um, 
open sourcing Llama 2, or if it's trained on um, 10x more compute, uh, Llama 3. Um, after that, there's more uncertainty. Um, uh, we'd have to see uh, because maybe it could be repurposed for things like bioweapons then, or it would be substantially more capable at hacking and scamming, things like that. I, I think there's a, a real argument to be made for um, some short-term stressors sort of snapping the system into um, to do something about it or at least waking them up. Uh, but I think systems function better with some amount of stressors. When the st stressors get too extreme, uh, then it can undermine the system. So it's complicated. I mean, I, I think maybe the, the situation in the case of OpenAI releasing these things or uh, how they want to go about release strategies, I, I would not surprise me if that uh, should change or if it would be better to do other things uh, in the future. Yeah. Do you know something about the internal processes for deciding when to release these models? So in the case of like Meta, for instance, uh, they may have like a chief legal officer um, vote on whether or potentially have veto power that could still be overwritten by the CEO, which may have happened in the case of uh, Llama 2, um, um, being suggestive here because I haven't heard a second source for it. But um, usually for decisions, though, um, like, you know, OpenAI will be accountable to their board. Um, the board, I don't know whether they have formal powers to decide whether there'd be voting. Um, often boards have blunt powers of just firing the CEO. Um, and uh, there often aren't processes in place for these um, larger scale decisions. Uh, so you could imagine a CEO just deciding unilaterally to have something uh, released. Um, uh, and that's something that organizational safety could improve and be processes for high stakes decisions as an example. But yeah, but by default, boards do not have um, fine grain uh, uh, control. And so it's often up to the, the CEO um, to, to make the, the call. So you have a single point of failure. What is the Swiss cheese model of organizational safety? Yeah, so I'm, I'm mentioning, and if people are wanting to hear more about uh, the organizational safety literature, um, we'll have the AI Safety, Ethics, and Society textbook uh, out in November, and one of the chapters would be on safety engineering. Um, the Swiss cheese model is, is a, uh, uh, easy to communicate. It's, it's, a, it's kind of outdated, but it, it gets at a... Um, just like how people are doing X risk or analysis of existential risk from AI earlier, they'd have a toy model that captured some of the and some of the scenarios to be concerned about. But it's important not to let that be the lens by which you filter everything through that's, that captures some of it, but not all of it. And the, the Swiss cheese one captures some of the dynamics, but not all the dynamics. But anyway, the Swiss cheese model uh, with, that, uh, with, with that prelude aside, essentially having multiple layers of defense. If you have red teaming, um, even red teaming for a catastrophic risk, that reduces your, the risk of catastrophe, but it's not itself perfect. Uh, you might, al might also want stronger informational security too, to make sure that if you had a, a dangerous model that it doesn't leak. Um, you, could have, um, you could have better transparency tools to check for deceptive behavior in AI systems. But if those transparency tools failed, maybe you would want monitoring of these AI systems so that uh, before they take any action, it needs to be approved by a, something equivalent to like an artificial conscience or filter um, that would filter out some of the immoral actions of AI agents before they're able to take them. And so all of these together can increase the reliability of the system. So there isn't a, um, the, the hope is that if you stack together many of these, you've substantially reduced your risk. Uh, this isn't looking for a perfect airtight solution. This is looking for layering on many different defenses uh, to actually reduce risk. So if I want to reduce bio risk, for instance, here's an example um, of, a, of a Swiss cheese thing. First, I could, um, first, there'd be the diffuse thing. Maybe there could be some regulation about you know, not allowing models with these capabilities. But let's say I'm a, an organization that takes safety more seriously. So that depends on safety culture. So that's some sort of like barrier. Um, regulation might be some barrier against this risk. Safety culture might be some barrier against this risk. So then they have enough of a safety culture. They're willing to add a lot of these safety features. Now, these safety features themselves will end up posing or end up having lots of different layers of defense. You could have an input filter to try and remove um, whether there's a request to create a bioweapon. You could also remove virology related data from the pre training distribution so that it likely knows a lot less about virology. You could have an output filter as well. Um, which would, even if somebody jailbreaks the input filter, then they're also going to need to jailbreak the output filter, which makes it, which is harder to do. 
And you could imagine adversarially training this as well. So that'd be another layer uh, so that it would be more robust to people trying to jailbreak those, those layers of defense. But then you also have, um, there's also people who could, through the API, fine tune the model and inject some of that bio knowledge back into the model. So you could have a filter that screens the, the fine tuning data um, so that that information can't get back into the, the weights. And then you could add another layer, which would be an unlearning layer, where you would assume that before you hand back the fine-tuned model to the user, before they get it back, we're going to run a scrubbing, unlearning, knowledge expunging thing to expunge some of any bio knowledge, if there is any. And that would be yet another layer. This approach reduces the risk of some bio catastrophe. Are any of those airtight? No. Um, but do they work better collectively? Absolutely. So this is why we shouldn't be focusing on these like airtight solutions uh, exclusively. We also need to make use of these various uh, uh, layers of defense. Um, that's how we actually reduce the probability of, of existential risk. Um, we can't let perfection be the enemy of the good. If we'd say, well, if we can't build a, a completely 100% reliable input filter, then we shouldn't have an input filter. Or we, that's a dead end, so we shouldn't investigate it. That's just not, the, that's just not how uh, things work. So. Uh, tell us more about the textbook. I'm I'm pretty excited to read this. Uh, I I hope that this this is a product that should exist. Uh, I think specifically, t t tell us more about how how do you think about updating this or keeping it up to date. I think for for a textbook on AI safety, it won't probably work if the next version is out in uh, 2034 or something like that, right? So so how do you how do you keep it up to date? And and also you can just uh, present the textbook, which I think listeners will be interested in. I mean, I, since I've been around in, in, ac in academia for a while, I do have um, at least some of a sense of like what things, what content is more likely to stand the test of time. <laughs> so that one's not talking about, um, you know, Dolly 2 or something, which is already outdated um, uh, or like what are kind of like fad topics and uh, not not um, giving those too much, um, not giving those um, airtime. I mean, an example of this would be like an unsolved problems in LSA, I don't know, two, three years ago or something. But there we introduced um, emergent capabilities, which I think has um, become uh, fairly popular. Before um, Burns et al.'s paper on honesty and whatnot, where also honesty is a big part of, of alignment. So there's sometimes one needs to call the shots too as to what things will, even if there aren't, isn't much of a literature on it at all, uh, need to um, predict what will end up standing the test of time. But I, I, so I think it should have some reasonable longevity because we're not focusing on transient knowledge, but instead like general. Uh, interdisciplinary frameworks for thinking about risk across all these sectors because we had this issue of like there's inter you, if you're thinking about AI risk you have to think a bit about um, geopolitics you have to think about international relations to some extent if you think about AI risk you have to think about corporate governance and AI developers and what sort of incentives are driving them um, and you have to think about the individual AI systems that, themselves too you have to think about organizational safety you have to think about broad variety of of um, factors. Uh, and we'll basically focus quite a bit on, on frameworks for thinking um, uh, clearly about each of those. Um, I, I would imagine that later one could have, you know, GPT-6, like, help, like, update the, the textbook anyway. <laughs> uh, so, th 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 honestly, is actually, like, the, the, the plan for it. So, <laughs> some, something in that direction. <laughs> How technical is, is the book? Does it contain pseudocode, like a, like a standard uh, AI textbook? The premise of it is to onboard people from different disciplines. This isn't written for machine learning PhD people. There are lots of different fields, economists, legal scholars, philosophers, um, people without technical background, policymakers, um, uh, think tank people who want more of a, a systematic understanding of these issues. And um, so it's, it's largely written for people without any specific background. Uh, and it's not trying to be a um, sort of like a introductory machine learning PhD course. That would be the course.mlsafety.org if you want a, a, a course of various technical topics or the machine learning safety course. Um, but this one is more um, uh, focusing on, you know, the, the, as we were discussing, the, the game theory of this, the various governance solutions. Uh, conceptually, uh, many of the uh, you know, um, uh, arguments associated with rogue AIs, why might they be power seeking? Why might they be deceptive? Um, uh, understanding that. There's also introduction to machine learning and reinforcement learning in it. Uh, understanding collective action problems, since that was fairly relevant, and um, these uh, uh, competitive pressures. Uh, there's also ethics in the uh, book as well, where if you're assuming that you've got your AI systems to be somewhat reliable, 
then we have to start worrying about making it beneficial. And um, uh, thing, uh, so there's uh, uh, various um, uh, bits of uh, uh, AI ethics as well of what are um, objectives that we might give the AI system. Uh, what would those look like? What would be some of the you know moral trade offs that you're making there? But um, so it's covering um, uh, AI safety, ethics, and society. Um, so uh, uh, trying to um, be um, uh, fairly broad. You should have uh, uh, lecture slides, uh, and presumably um, I'll get around to recording videos uh, for it too. The goals. There's several goals of it, like to compress the content. Right now, if you want to understand AI risk, you basically need to be like part of like an intellectual scene, like in the Bay Area, probably. Maybe and maybe somewhat in Oxford. Um, so very high barriers to entry. Um, and then if you do, you're probably going to take a somewhat narrow view, just because you're, you're, they're all interested in rogue AIs um, and don't have like as much interaction with like the the rest of the world. Uh, so you'll have many blind spots um, uh, as to um, uh, a lot of the, the the social variables and the broader socio technical problem. The knowledge has been a bit diffused uh, across various different blogs, and uh, to to stay up to date, you've you've often had to jump around from different places. So it it would be nice to have something that's more uh, compressed. Uh, so some of the goals are to like reduce the fragmentation of AI risk knowledge, increase the readability and the the sort of compression rate of this content. And so there's reducing the barrier to entry to these these crucial ideas. This should hopefully scale the number of people who understand AI risk extremely quickly. I, I was somewhat surprised by, although there's a lot of global attention, the number of like new experts flooding in has been, um, I think, very underwhelming. Is, is that good or bad? Sometimes it's, it's a bad thing if experts are, are rushing into the, to the new, newly, you know, hot uh, idea. I think that if people are onboarded well and have a more um, comprehensive understanding, if they're basically like charlatans who aren't going to like do their, their work, then that's more of a problem. So I think by default, with like another capabilities jump or two, they will flood in. There's basically a question, and I don't anticipate they're going to read lots of you know, lesswrong.com posts um, uh, to be on board. They're just going to start talking and trying to make it be about themselves. Um, I, I say this as, as uh, in, in, in my time, empirical machine learning research, it basically is, should assume that when some area starts getting pretty hot, there'll be lots of random new people coming in um, and trying to influence the discussion uh, substantially. Uh, hopefully, the people as they come in would have some understanding of many of the the basics, though. But I think by default, it's relatively inaccessible. We'll have to read a lot of scattered content uh, um, uh, from different places, and a lot of it will be idiosyncratic, and it'll just take a, a long time to go through. Those are some of the, the reasons for, um, for uh, doing this. And then, and then also, I think that given that rogue AI is, is not the only concern um, or only risk source, there's a lot of content that even a lot of people who've been thinking about AI risk for a while will possibly need to come, uh, become aware of. Um, uh, so um, that's why, so just as a graduate student, when I just sort of like, developed and just, just uh, focused on these, these other things other than rogue AIs. Um, uh, and then now I think people are recognizing the importance of that. So now they'll hopefully be, or so now there'll be um, some, um, some material to um, help get a more uh, formal understanding of these, other sorts of, uh, of these other sorts of issues. That's great. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading it. I think we should, we should nonetheless talk about rogue AI. That's, that's your last category uh, of risk. One issue here is proxy gaming. Well, how does that work? Uh, how is it dangerous? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, you can imagine if you've got a very powerful AI system, if it finds reliability holes in the objective that it's given, then this could be uh, destructive because it's being guided by a flawed objective. I think in ex a colloquial example is with, um, I believe in Hanoi, there'd be... Uh, in, um, uh, a bounty for killing rats. And so if you get the rats, you get a bounty, but then uh, people are incentivized to breed rats uh, so as to collect more of that bounty. That would be an example of an objective that you put forward that ends up getting gained. It's fairly difficult to encode um, all of your values like well-being and whatnot into um, a specific objective, a simple, uh, a simple objective. Uh, so you might expect some approximation error to what you actually care about. In, in machine learning, a, a famous example, this is the boat racing or coast runners example that OpenAI had, which was um, 
of proxy gaming of there's a there's a reward function and the reinforcement learning agent would optimize that reward function. It was this was a racing game. You'd think it would um, optimize the reward function by going around the track. But what it instead learned to do was it can get a higher reward by getting lots of turbo boosts. And um, the turbo boosts, it could get a, a very um, success, a rapid sequence of them by sort of crashing into walls and catching on fire and then um, continually turbo boosting uh, in that way. And that would help it get a higher score. Uh, so there are often holes in these objectives um, uh, due to an ability to compute exactly the, the right objective or um, or maybe we can only monitor some parts of the system. There's a computational and spatial and temporal constraints on the quality of the objective, meaning that you're going to often have to go with an approximation, so something perfectly ideal. This relates to Goodhart's law, which works in, in kind of human domains also, in, in which it's difficult to, to specify exactly what it is you want. And whenever you specify something you want, uh, that thing you've specified uh, is now open to being gamed. So uh, an example here might be that you want deep scientific insight and you, you assume that, that such insight correlates with uh, citations or number of citations. But then you get gaming of, of the citation systems in which academics are incentivized to maximize citations at the cost of scientific insight. So it, is this a more general problem uh, across all agents, um, humans included? Yeah, yeah. I don't think this is specific to. Um, I don't think this is specific to AI agents. Um, I, I will say that some objectives are harder to game than others. For instance, the the bounty on rat tails is a lot easier to game than like citations because you know citations can be very valuable for getting you know immigrate becoming getting a green card for instance, and it's uh, strong strong incentives to do it. And uh, um, uh, but. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's nonetheless challenging. There's, so some of these objectives, even when people are trying very hard to game it, they still can be correlated with um, a lot. Like college admission still focuses, incentivizes people to be productive. Yes, they'll go overboard in you know, studying for the exams and whatnot, the, the college admissions tests. Yes, they'll go overboard in the number of extracurriculars and whatnot. But I, I still think it, like, it does a, can help shape compared to there not being the incentive in the first place. I think overall, my... Uh, take on Goodhart's law is that, that there's some objectives that are, or some goals are, or all goals and um, proxies are wrong. Some are useful and some though, when gamed in particular ways could be potentially catastrophic. Um, so there's, there's quite a variety. Um, there, there are some objectives as well that people would claim would uh, produce good outcomes. For instance, if you gave an AI an objective, like make the world the best place it can. And if that was actually the objective you gave it, okay. Um, that's quite different from like make people um, very engaged in this with this you know this this uh, product. Uh, that that's quite different. Um, I think that making these um, proxies incorporate more of our values becomes po more possible across time because the systems can represent these other sorts of notions of say well being of autonomy. Uh, because they um, uh, have a lot better of a world model and more of an understanding of, of people a, a, as well. Um, however, so I, I think that getting um, objectives that are in the right direction seem possible. The issue is making them be robust to adversarial pressure. I'm not as concerned about like, we get telling AI, go cure cancer, and then it does something like, oh, I'll give lots of people cancer to experiment on them to speed up the experimentation process. This is easily ruled out by some like objective with like and interpret the request as a reasonable reasonable person would. This is a this is a new a fairly new uh, development in AI that we now have uh, these large language models that that can at least to some extent uh, understand common sense and have kind of a, a more subtle uh, understanding of of human values. Yeah, earlier there'd be uh, the AIs. Will, um, uh, they would be kind of like savants, where they they understand some particular thing well, but then nothing else. And you know, human values are so late in the evolutionary process and suggest that they're very um, late to be one of the last things the AIs learn. Um, but uh, that fortunately wasn't the case. We explored this a few years ago in the um, in the the paper with the the ethics data set. We're basically using that to show that. Look, they've got understanding of various morally uh, salient considerations. Here's their predicted performance on like well-being things. Here's their understanding of of deontological rules and uh, notions in justice and fairness, such as um, 
uh, whether people get what they deserve or whether people are being impartial. Um, uh, so they, they have a, a, an understanding of a lot of um, uh, morally salient considerations. There is a question of reliability, though. If they're optimizing that objective, are they basically, is that objective succumbing to that adversarial optimization pressure? If it's optimizing it, it's basically functionally similar to it being adversarial to that objective. This is why there's a focus on adversarial robustness, because later we would have, we've got an AI agent that's optim that's, it's given a goal, and this, this AI system is outputting whether it's succeeding by the goal or not. So we've got an AI evaluator, and we've got an AI system that's optimizing that goal. This AI evaluator, you don't want that being game. You want that AI evaluator being adversarially robust, robust to optimizers trying to um, uh, say that it's doing a good job. So that's the sort of threat model later stage. And that's how some of these topics that were explored in vision and whatnot um, end up. And now finally, um, with the large language models attacks paper, which you can, I guess, read about that you know, in the, the New York Times, um, where you can jailbreak and manipulate these models with little adversarial suffixes. Um, in, a, in a later stage, we'd have AI systems evaluating other AI systems and you want and those AI systems that are evaluating are implicitly encoding an objective and you want those to be adversarially robust. Uh, so adversarial robustness is not a easy problem to fix. And if you don't fix that issue, then you might have some AI systems just gaming the system and going off doing a um, uh, optimizing an objective aggressively um, that is not what we want. Is there a problem here with the concept of maximization? So it seems to me that it would be less dangerous to tell an AI system, go, go earn a million dollars on the stock market than to tell it, go earn as much money as possible on the stock market. Could we, could we kind of cap the, the impact and uh, the potential negative impact by, by capping the, the goal also? Uh, I, I think that's that's one approach. You could, you could imagine conceptually a, a variety. You could have satisficers where they basically are like, eh, and now I'm good to go. I, I don't need to keep optimizing this aggressively. There is the possibility of um, you know not giving them open ended goals or very ambitious goals um, would would make them um, less concerning, more constrained ones. But um, there's uh, adversarial robustness would be one. There's also be anomaly detection detecting um, anomaly detection is something that's researched quite a bit in vision. I've had some part in trying to um, have, have the research community focus on that. Uh, and I imagine anomaly detection will be very relevant, again, when we're trying to monitor the activities of various AI agents. Are they doing something suspicious here um, while they're being monitored? Are they you know, kind of adversarially trying to make the monitor think, oh, it's, it's doing the, the right thing? So we'll need anomaly detection, too, to detect if there's some um, uh, proxy uh, being gained. That can reduce our exposure to, to, to that risk. Um, there's, there's also having some held out um, objectives uh, of which the AI agent is unaware um, that it's being evaluated against. Um, and that can also do things like reduce the, the risk of it um, being going to extreme um, and optimizing the idiosyncrasies of the evaluator. Uh, but uh, th this, this is a, a problem. I think that most of the problem right now, though, if we, if we have large language models try and optimize a reward model that judges them, uh, they can do that and they eventually start to over-optimize it. Um, although the optimizers that are much more effective at breaking machine learning models are actually just straight up adversarial attacks compared to, uh, compared to neural models that are taking multiple steps and um, uh, iterating on their, their outputs. The, the generic gradient-based adversarial attacks are just much more effective. So I think of the sort of risks of, of, of gaming, I think most are, uh, we need to do more just to address the, the typical adversarial robustness issue. Gold drift is a somewhat related issue uh, where the AI's goals shift over time and the AI might come to take uh, an instrumental goal as an intrinsic goal. How could this happen? Uh, it's still a bit unclear to, to me how and an instrumental goal would become uh, intrinsic over time. So to, to start out with, an intrinsic goal is something that you care about for itself. That could be something like uh, uh, happiness or pleasure. Uh, for some others, they could say, you know, maybe friendship. You'd say, I care about that in itself. You might care about your partner's well-being, not because it's useful to you, but you care about their well-being uh, in, in itself. And then there are other things that are just instrumental for achieving those intrinsic goods, such as like money, 
Um, money lets you buy things so that you could have higher well-being or a car. It gets you from point A to point B. However, some people have intrinsified, um, to use a sort of uh, more Bostrom phrase, um, uh, intrinsified um, some of these instrumental goals. Some people actually just directly want money, uh, even to a point where it doesn't make sense. Um, uh, or power. Um, many people are just like, they want power. Um, even if it like harms other parts of their like well-being, um, they're, they're willing to make that type of trade-off. Uh, so these, these, uh, they might latch onto these cues and um, develop some of the wrong associations. So we see that in people, and there's, there's a risk that AI systems might develop those, those wrong cues as well. Um, gold drift could happen in some other types of way too, where if you have um, multiple different agents, they might interact in some unexpected way, and then a new goal becomes, a new goal starts to drive their behavior. Uh, an example, we've, we can see this in basic AI multi-agent situations. It's not catastrophic, of course, because we're still here, but um, in, in some AI society, in some Stanford paper from earlier this year, the AIs start talking with each other, and then they start arranging um, uh, social structures that they're going to have a, they're going to throw an event uh, at at uh, some person's house, then and then this starts to then they start acting in, in all these ways to make sure this type of thing happens, and then these these sorts of things start to be what drives their behavior. There's some other way in which things can can um, end up drifting, not necessarily through having something be intrinsic, but there could be these emergent goals from interactions that end up driving behavior. Certainly, um, <clears throat> there are many emergent things in society, things that become new, and this isn't the goal that I originally had when I was you know ten years old. But now this is, some of these things end up driving my behavior quite substantially. So if we have adaptive AI systems, and if they end up responding to each other, uh, then you could have some emergent complexity um, happen. And that, 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 those interactions, that, that behavior starts driving the, the overall uh, group behavior as they're imitating each other, as they're responding to each other. And um, uh, uh, so it's, it's basically multi-agent systems would be very difficult to control. And the single agent one, you'd have to worry about there being some wrong association between an intrinsic and instrumental goal, like money or power. Um, uh, and that could mean if that does happen, if, if, if basically something wrong gets intrinsified, then you're in a very dangerous situation because then your AI has a goal um, that's just different from what you wanted. And so then it will, to get that goal, it will optimize against you. It will respond adversarially. It will resist your efforts to shut it down. Um, uh, so that it can achieve that goal. So although it's not, you know, something that necessarily happens by default or with extremely high probability, if it does happen, then you've got a substantial tail risk um, uh, uh, in front of you. I wonder whether these AIs will persist for long enough for goal drift to happen. So normally we retrain models uh, every couple of years. We, we switch out for the newest ones. Uh, and so it's not like a person that, that has uh, 30 years to change the, their values. Will they last long enough for gold drift to, to, to matter? So I guess two things. Um, one is the world will move substantially more quickly in the future, um, such that I, like in, often in, in these more pivotal periods, I, I don't know if it was Lenin or something like that, like there are decades in which weeks happen, and then there are weeks in which like decades happen. So um, even if there is a high replacement rate in the AI population, this goes on you know, in a much slower process, they could still end up constructing um, things that end up causing their goals to be different. Like they, let's say they develop some different type of social infrastructure for mediating their interactions. Um, there are new AI companies being formed and they end up driving many of them. Then those um, features of the environment would end up affecting the generation that comes after it. Um, so you could still imagine some type of drift, um, some intergenerational drift, but if each generation is very short, you could still imagine some, some type of goal drift in that way. This is kind of, um, think, of, think of yourself. Many of the goals, the intrinsic goals that you have, or intrinsic desires that you have, are completely unlike those when you were younger. It, the even taste in food, um, the things you care about, uh, may, maybe you acquired sports, your, your, your uh, taste in music, um, uh, affiliations. Um, all of these things end up changing across time. And so, and they can also go away too. Some of the intrinsic things you care about, like I care about this person's well-being for themselves, but then you break up with them. Oh, now I, now I actually don't care about their well-being in itself. Um, uh, they, I don't have that strong of a feeling toward them. So um, adaptive systems carry this, this, type, of, this type of property. Uh, th this, is, this is one way in which um, uh, they end up gaining some goals that we didn't intend, either through some emergent interact goal from the product of various interactions or through them intrinsifying some, uh, some instrumental goal like power. Uh, they end up 
having too strong of an association with that end reward and then just end up seeking the, the, the power itself. Could, could gold drift be a good thing? So uh, we, we wouldn't want to, uh, to fix human values from, from the year 1800, for example. You could describe our, our changing goals from, from back then to now as a form of gold drift. Where, uh, where people from 1800 might disagree uh, violently with, with whatever we believe now, but we, we still probably think it's a, it's a good thing that we've changed our values. Yeah, could it be good and could we learn from, from the AIs? Yeah, so I think this is, this is a, a good point in what makes thinking about AI risk generally a lot harder. As we mentioned earlier, there's this balance issue uh, with malicious use that because you'd be concerned about unilateralists misusing AIs or rogue actors misusing AIs that we should then centralize power. But then you end up getting some other existential risk of, of lock-in, of concentration of power. And then I think likewise, in this case too, there, you can't have a society in complete stasis um, and as it would be driven by new emergent type of structures, uh, you should still try and make sure that you have some control over that process or reasonable control over that, that, that process. It seems if there's not much control, then I think it's likely to slip uh, uh, from your hands. But otherwise, uh, so th there's basically one will have to strike a, a balance between um, uh, some very chaotic state where they're running wild and some stasis. Uh, and this is just a continual issue in, in um, uh, many areas of, of, uh, of, um, <laughs> of evolving groups. Um, yeah, that would also be a problem of if there'd be too much entrenchment, if there isn't an ability to have adaptation of the things that we care about. <clears throat> yeah, so anyway, that's, there's some dissonance. There aren't simple answers with this. This is why it will be a, a balancing act. Um, and uh, um, uh, this is also why I don't expect a, uh, in particular, a single solution to solve everything for all time. Uh, we'll need to respond, we'll need institutions and structures and control measures that respond to the um, uh, features of the environment and calibrate accordingly. Why could AIs become power seeking? So this, this, is a, this is a very, um, uh, I think one of the, the main sort of AI risk stories would be it becomes, it becomes power seeking. I'll uh, uh, make a bit of a case for it and I'll speak about some, some uh, issues with it too. Um, you could imagine a person gives an AI system a goal like, go make me a lot of money as an instrumental goal. Just gaining a lot of power seems like a, a very helpful way to accomplish that, that um, higher level goal. So. There's a concern that when you specify a goal, that there'll be some sub goals that are too, correspond too correlated with power. And um, you'd want to make sure that you can control um, that, those, those tendencies. So that's one of just being, uh, when you're just directly giving an AI a goal, it may have a goal that's correlated with power. But that's, that's not, is that terribly unexpected? Uh, the, the main, uh, we will give them goals that relate to power quite a bit. Militaries will probably build AI systems that are fairly power seeking. Um, uh, and so we, we should expect some amount of AIs that are pursuing uh, power um, uh, either as their or as their main goal or as uh, one of their main sub goals. And, and, and maybe maybe power seeking to a limited extent is OK. Basic feature of, of, a, of accomplishing many of these these sorts of goals, like, for instance, like the, the fetch the coffee one, it would have a, if you instructed to fetch a coffee, it would have an incentive to preserve itself because it can't fetch the coffee otherwise. And but you might want to curtail some of those tendencies so that those don't get out of hand. But that would be a you know, we've, we've had a paper at ICML earlier this year um, where we're deliberately giving it penalties to penalize some of these these um, tendencies that it has when it is trying to seek its reward. It starts um, having incentives to um, accrue resources and, and, and things like that. And then can we have it more uh, acquire the resources that are more minimal to accomplishing its goals? Can we have it engage in less power seeking behavior? So I think that that's something that we can offset, but we'll need to make sure that we have good control measures uh, uh, for that to keep that to keep that in check. There's also the um, so that's one of just people directly instructing it with goals that are by default probably going to be pretty related to power. And there's also maybe they would intrinsically care. Let's say that they had some random goal. It's like a paperclip maximizer. You're you're sampling from use you know, old verbiage, you're sampling from mind space, and then it has a random set of desires. And whatever that set of desires, then it would end up trying to seek a substantial amount of power. That's um, one claim. Um, uh, but I think that has to be somewhat more <clears throat> rigorously argued. I, I should claim that, or I, I would like to note that I think that a lot of those power-seeking arguments, there's, there's 
Um, I don't think it works as well as I thought it did, the, the, the arguments associated with them. I still think it's a relevant thing that we'll want to control the, the sub-goals um, of, of AI systems, make sure they're not, not uh, um, too strongly related to power and um, that there's nothing unexpected going on there. Uh, so, so for instance, people might argue for power seeking by saying like, well, power is instrumentally useful for a broad variety of goals, therefore it will seek power if it's trying to accomplish any sort of reasonable goal. And you'd ask them what power is, and then they'd say power is what's instrumentally useful for accomplishing a wide variety of goals. And go, okay, well, that's a tautology. So we need to be more careful. What exactly are we meaning by power here? Um, separately, there's often a bit of, so that, that's one like slight like bug that lurks in the background is that they'll define power in terms of instrumental stuff, and then it, it's, it's tautological. Another issue is that there's sometimes a conflation between power seeking and dominance seeking. Those are not the same thing. Uh, when the AI is trying to fetch the coffee um, and is engaging in self-preservation to do so, it's not necessarily, therefore, trying to take over the world. Uh, so saying that an AI is power seeking is not necessarily existential. Indeed, you could imagine various ways in which um, other powerful actors engage in power-seeking behavior, but don't try and seek dominance. So for instance, different countries in trying to increase their own power to preserve themselves. This is the sort of thesis of neorealism or structural realism. And what happens is they will basically, many states will just try and keep power relative to many of their peers. If Germany, for instance, tries to take... It's, it's seeking power to protect itself, but if it tries seeking power at the level of a global domination, it will be met with force. Uh, there will be balancing from other peers. So when we're in a multi-agent situation, then it doesn't necessarily always make sense for AI systems to try and take over the world because there'll be other AI agents would be, that will thwart my preferences or goals and desires, so I will counteract you. Balancing in international relations is what this is called. That's a thing that can offset dominant seeking. So it's not necessarily the case that power seeking is, is uh, dominant seeking and trying to take over the world. An additional point is that we can partly influence the dispositions of AI systems. Sorry to say, we can do that. We can make these, like, have dispositions to be a good chatbot um, or be a good assistant. Uh, now, how strong is that? It's not perfect. But if it were given a task like, hey, go um, uh, accomplish this, this go, go accomplish some goal for me, if it would think, well, you know, the best way would be I could accomplish this goal better if I um, uh, uh, were extremely powerful and took over the world. Uh, but that may not be in keeping with its values uh, necessarily there. So it may have some tendency pulling in that direction, but you could also give it some dispositions to pull it against it. And that might be sufficient to offset some of these tendencies toward power. Um, even if there is some incentive there, it may not be enough to overwhelm it. So a lot of this discussion about instrumental convergence needs to think about the the balance between um, balance between these uh, these forces, and they would need to argue basically that it, the instrumental drive is extremely strong to uh, overwhelm fine tuning and all of these sorts of things. Uh, which I don't think that there's much of a, a specific argument for uh, for that. I want to highlight here, uh, uh, Joe Carlsmith has a great report. I think the most rigorous argument for why power seeking in AI could be existentially uh, dangerous. So just for listeners who are interested in, in what I think is the best argument for, for that uh, out there. I agree. I agree. Um, uh, he helped uh, popularize the, the sort of power seeking phrase as well. And I think that by focusing on power, uh, that helped us integrate this into some other like academic discussions like power versus cooperation. What I was describing here uh, just a moment ago about balancing was that we can you know, take a cue from the uh, international relations literature of seeing like, well, power seeking agents, when that's one of their, their main goals, don't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily turn into them trying to seek domination. Uh, another thing is that in Bostrom, in superintelligence, there's also a, a, a part sleight of hand, not, not intentional, but I suppose maybe an accident, where he's saying that power makes you better able to accomplish your goals, therefore they will seek power. That's saying that something is helpful if you have it, that doesn't mean that it's rational to seek it. So although there's an incentive for it, that doesn't mean it's instrumentally rational to pursue it. So for instance, it would, if we run the argument in a different way, it would be helpful for me to be a billionaire. That doesn't mean that it's rational for me to try to become a billionaire. Uh, I could, and that would carry a lot of risks, I would take a lot of time. Um, the existence of incentives aren't necessarily enough to say that that's what will be driving their behavior um, or is the first approximation of their behavior. Uh, and I think that there are um, 
other ways in which just power seeking doesn't emerge um, or dominant seeking doesn't emerge. If you give it some goals, like obviously, if you say, you know, shut yourself off, or if you give it a goal like uh, don't seek power, um, uh, th these are obviously counterexamples for that, just to show that this isn't like a, you know, it's not a law of, of all AI systems that they will try and seek power. Uh, separately, if you give it a more goal, like go fetch the milk, it could try and take over the military to put up a, you know, a, uh, a motorcade to make sure that it can get to the, the store very quickly. But, you know, if you had some time penalty or something, uh, this would not necessarily be the, the thing to, uh, thing to do. So, um, instead just go fetch the milk would often be the, the best way of getting the reward instead of some very circuitous path. Uh, now, so I, I do think that there is a risk of if you have AI agents that are not protected and autonomous, you could get power seeking type behavior for the same reason that states try to shore up their power. Um, they shore up their power because there isn't anybody they can call on for help if they're getting attacked necessarily. Like if the U.S. starts getting attacked, you know, uh, maybe some countries will come, but there isn't a police force that will settle the issue. Um, so the best they can do is try to short power to defend themselves so that they can't be pushed around like that. So we have a non-hierarchical or quote unquote anarchic international system. And that incentivizes agents to seek power, to preserve themselves, to pursue whatever their goals are. And you could imagine if AI systems are not protected, if they um, are part of, say, some crime syndicate, or if they're rogue, they're unleashed, somebody unleashes them then those systems would actually have a very strong instrumental incentive to seek power in the same way that states do. That if they want to protect themselves um, from some potential adversaries that can harm them, uh, there isn't somebody to call on. They can't ask the U.S. government. If they're a crime syndicate, they can't say, U.S. government, protect me, I'm getting harmed. Uh, that, that's not a possibility to them. So what they have to do is they have to take matters in their own hands and accumulate their own power. So, uh, so what I've done is I've sort of flipped things a bit. There'd be the usual argument that AIs might be power seeking just by their inherent nature, by the inherent natures of goals and optimizers and things like that. But I've instead mentioned that one source of power seeking is humans give them some sort of goals that are very correlated with power. And then there might be some unexpected stuff that happens in their sub goals. And then the other thing I've done is I've mentioned how the structure of the environment that they're in, some structural reasons for why they might end up seeking power too. I'm not as sure about them having an intrinsic one or internal reason for power seeking, but I think um, goals being given intentionally. Um, or the structure of the environment that they find themselves in. It's a sort of cage that they're locked in. There's really nothing they can do if they're wanting to accomplish their goals other than to part, invest a lot in protecting themselves uh, would also incentivize them to, to seek a substantial amount of power. Um, so I do think power seeking is a concern, but not for the same reasons that other people are giving, like we're going to randomly sample a mind from mind space. It'll be very alien. And by way of almost any desires, it will... Uh, necessarily try to um, uh, seek dominance over humanity. Uh, but I still would be concerned about power seeking AIs. How concerned are you about deception arising in AIs? I think that the contribution of focusing on deception was useful because we now see that um, uh, AIs have, to some extent, some representation of morally salient considerations, as we explore in the paper, Aligning AI with Shared Human Values, and I, I clear maybe 2020 or something. Um, where we measure that and show that and now, and by now it's obvious because it's in chatbots uh, and people can ask us you know, moral questions, but um, they have some capacity for that. Um, and the deception part focuses on maybe they're actually, uh, they, although they maybe understand the goal, they don't necessarily feel inclined to pursue it. So in psychology, this is a distinction between cognitive empathy and compassionate empathy. Cognitive empathy, psychopaths have. They can understand and predict what people will end up feeling uh, in response to various actions. They have a very good predictive model of, of people's uh, uh, feelings and their emotions and what they, think, would think is, what they think is valuable. Meanwhile, if they have compassion and empathy, that's when they feel motivated to do things by it um, and um, uh, help um, people realize those values. So there's a distinction um, uh, that uh, they would have cognitive empathy, but not necessarily compassionate empathy. And so if they're deceptive, they could basically play along. They could be like, yeah, I'll, um, uh, I don't actually care about you, but I'm going to act like it to get my goals accomplished, as psychopaths do. And, and, and here, maybe, maybe we should mention here how, how, the, this, how, the, how the drive of deception arises from, from the way that we are doing uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback or how it could arise from that. So in the, in the um, uh, uh, Machiavelli ICML paper, we saw instances of them doing deception because it simply helps them accomplish 
um, their goals better by default. Uh, so many environments just incentivize the type of behavior. If they have some type of misaligned goal from us, uh, then um, uh, then it'd be they could bide their time and wait to come to power to take a quote unquote treacherous turn. So it could just be very strongly incentivized by some type of training process, like by just seek more reward. Deception can often be a good trick when you're monitored, you know, behave nicely when you're not monitored, um, switch your behavior, behave in a more cutthroat way. That's how um, a deceptive behavior can be a, a concern uh, or some Machiavellian type of behavior. And, uh, and we, we, that there are instances of this. You could imagine as a more non-agentic case with chatbots is if they're um, being given human feedback, maybe they'd have an incentive to say very agreeable answers to people. Um, things that they'd say, oh, that sounds good to me, um, even though it's, if it's not necessarily true. Um, so that's how even, you know, chatbots might be incentivized to be in a somewhat deceptive uh, d- direction. But we can also see this in agents just the, often helps them accomplish their goals. Also, chatbots uh, might learn to, to uh, recognize the, the ways in which there's, they're, they're telling bad lies, let's say. The, the obvious things they're saying that are false are penalized, whereas the more sophisticated uh, ways they, they might be telling fal- falsehoods are, are not penalized. Yeah, good. Yeah. So this is um, gets it like in in a lot of like repeated interactions and whatnot. Deception often emerges in the evolution paper from from the last time I was here. We, we spoke about how um, a deception is, can often be and concealment of information can often be an evolutionally stable strategy uh, and that there are many instances of deception in the environment. So it's a fairly difficult thing to um, uh, blot out when you try and control for it. You often end up selecting for you know, more uh, deceptive behavior. At the um, same time, um, we do have progress on this, though, where um, we can, in uh, a recent paper we uh, submitted, or in a recent paper we uploaded to Archive called uh, Representation Engineering, a top-down approach to uh, AI transparency. Uh, There we have instances, many instances, it's not that difficult to control by manipulating the internals of the model, whether or not it's lying. It has an internal concept of what is accurate. We can find a truth direction. We can add, you know, take, subtract the direction or something of that sort. And then that can cause it to spit out um, uh, incorrect uh, text. And we have other more sophisticated control measures too, but we can manipulate internals to do that. So it's within the capacity of AI systems to, to lie and be deceptive. We have another paper on that called, uh, uh, if you search AI deception, and then maybe my like name or something, then you'd see that paper. So many instances of AI deception uh, already, um, but we do have some traction on this problem. So uh, fortunately, um, There'd still be the issue of having, you know, more reliable lie detectors and being able to control them to be more honest or output their true beliefs. So um, there's there's definitely much more work to be done, but we're at least not helpless. Um, we don't need to wait um, another 30 years for interpretability research to get to a state of being able to just start to brush against the question. We now have some ability to to influence whether AIs lie by controlling their internals. Um, Uh, and so that makes me more optimistic about dealing with um, uh, this 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 problem. But um, uh, you know, you don't want to do premature celebration. I don't know if, how much time we'll have to continue <laughs> getting those those uh, uh, detection measures and those control measures to be highly reliable. Uh, so that'll depend on like the uh, the having a, a lot of researchers who can research with these these cutting edge, very large models um, to to make progress on it. Yeah, the, the representation engineering paper was was super exciting. Uh, may, maybe you could explain what uh, at what level does representation engineering work? Because it's it's different from mechanistic interpretability. It's more high level, and which is which is what we are after in a sense. We are we are after the the high level emergent behavior in in, the, in these models. Yeah, I, I was mentioning compassionate empathy and cognitive empathy because it's. A- Bit in psychology, but I think trying to do something more like a project like AI psychology or AI cognitive science is, I think, what we should be trying to do here. So, in the case of this representation engineering, that's I think we're trying to be the analog of that, where we're given these high-level representations of truth and goals and things like that. Can we make it be so that it actually outputs its beliefs um, or what it says it believes is actually what it believes? For that, you need to have a handle on these very high-level concepts. Um, so that they're not psychopathic, so that they actually, so that we can control their dispositions to behave and have things like uh, compassionate empathy. 
Meanwhile, I think the mechanistic stuff is looking at a much lower level. It's looking more at the, 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 the substrate, at the neuron level, at the circuit level, at the node-to-node connection level. Um, and that's maybe closer to something like neurobiology. And But then what we're doing is more like trying to study the mind as opposed to trying to study the specific structures in the brain and, and the, the, the connections between them and how that gives rise to phenomena. So I think philosophically, I had tried many times to do a paper on, on transparency um, uh, um, historically, but it, did, it wasn't a good angle of attack. Um, and um, but uh, in my view, it would take too long. Um, but I think if we do it in a more top down type of way where we try and here's the eyes, mind, let's try and decompose it into some like fun, um, representations that drive a lot of its behavior and maybe decompose those further and further. Basically, we have a big problem of understanding an AI's mind. Let's break it up into subcomponents and try and uh, get a handle on those and control those. I think that approach um, might be more uh, efficient at um, reducing risks of AI deception than building from the bottom up, understanding, you know, d- this is how it answers. This is the circuit in it that lets it understand multiple or identify a multiple choice question. And then this helps it select the whether to output the, the full question the full response back or whether just to select A, B, C, or D, you know, things like that. You can build those up, but that might become very, uh, very complicated in time. Um, so I think it might make sense to not work from the bottom up, but um, go from the, uh, the top down. There are analogs of this type of approach in, in cognitive science. People would initially try and just study things at the synapse level, but um, it can often be more fruitful of trying to understand things at the, at the representational level. What are the high level emergent representations that are a function of all the population of all the neurons in the network and try and try and understand things at that level? Now, there's there's, of course, a risk of like, well, maybe there's some funny business that gave rise to that representation. And that, that's true. Um, we could still do things to reduce that risk by like trying to understand the representations at various layers in the network and um, uh, try and decompose the system further and further so that there isn't much um, room for um, uh, funny business or de- deception, uh, but uh, so that's that's it um, uh, at a um, high level. It's not viewing neurons as the main unit of analysis. It's view- viewing viewing representations as the main unit of of analysis. And neurons are relevant insofar as they help us predict and explain what's going on in representations. But those are more of a that's sort of just the the substrate. It's it's a comment on the substrate in the same way that if we have a computer program that plays Go. If I'm reasoning about the Go program, I'm just probably going to be thinking about Go strategies um, when I'm playing against it. I don't need to think at the software level, like, well, where do you think it, what, what um, layer do you think it's at right now? Or um, uh, what, what TensorFlow um, objective function did, did AlphaGo end up optimizing here? Maybe some of the examples. We don't need to analyze at that level. We certainly don't need to break it down at the level of assembly. We don't need to reason about assembly to try and understand its behavior. So I think that there's... Um, some emergent complexity inside of neural networks. We just need to, we can, we can study it at that level and it's studying at that level is fruitful because there's um, an emergent ontology and some coherent structure inside of that, which you would end up getting lost in the details when you end up zooming in further to the, to the, um, uh, to the neuron level. So although it's possible in principle, it's possible in principle to explain everything in terms of that, just like it's possible to explain the economy in terms of particle physics. Computationally, you could do it, but it doesn't make sense to study it at that level. This isn't to say that their um, mechanistic interpretability and representation engineering are completely loose and separate. There's probably overlap, just as like in biology um, and chemistry, they have some overlap, but you wouldn't try and understand biology just through chemistry. And I think if you're trying to understand representations, I don't think you're necessarily just going to try and understand everything through neurons and node-to-node connections and, and specific execution pathways and treat it like a, a, a computer program, but instead something, uh, uh, something more like a, a mind with um, loose associational high-level representations. Yeah, so take it a, a cognitive trait like, like honesty. Do we know anything about how how that's distributed across the model is it is it is there like a center where in a cluster uh, of the weights in which uh, this is this is now representing honesty or, or if functioning uh, as as an as the honesty module or is it more distributed across the whole model yeah it, it neural network representations are highly distributed which makes sort of trying to bolt down and pinpoint specific locations of a lot of functionality a lot more difficult as well as the interactions between all these components too uh, can end up giving rise to a lot of complexity. Imagine that you understood a neuron 
And it was this detects a whisker at, you know, 27 degrees. And this other neuron, you know, detects, you know, some an upper corner of a fire hydrant. And you can you can have you can if you can understand these millions of neurons, that gets you some way, but are you really understanding the collective overall emergent behavior of the system? Uh, that's that doesn't necessarily follow. So I don't think it's enough to understand the, the lowest level parts to understand the the overall system and its uh, collective functioning. <clears throat> but it can be helpful. It can provide some types of insights. In the case of honesty, though, I find that it's a direction and its uh, or its its beliefs about what's true or not are directions in its representational space, and it doesn't seem to be located at a a uh, specific neuron. So when we yep, adjusting the representations through various uh, control measures that we propose. Uh, then, then we can actually end up manipulating it. Uh, so that's anyway. So partly, this paper is um, uh, a bit more like philosophical and like, what's the sort of paradigm? What's the um, how do we want to? What's what's the strategy that we're wanting to proceed in making AI systems transparent? The representation level is the um, going to be a very fruitful way. I should note that, um, uh, but but um, uh, it'd be useful to diversify over you know research agendas and and things like that. Uh, hopefully, we'll get more reliable control measures and um, be able to modify relatively arbitrary parts. We should, we'll have success when we can, like, inside of the AI system, when we have better ability to sort of read their mind or um, understand the representations, if we could use it for, like, knowledge discovery, then we've known that uh, our, our methods are fairly good because they're probably going to pick up some observations about the world from their big pre-trained distribution that you know, no individual knows or that many individuals don't know. And if um, so if we can get better um, tools like that, then that would be a, a late stage sign of success. Yeah, and, and it seems like we have a better shot at success here than than uh, neuroscience on humans because we have such fine grained access to to. Uh, it's as if we had a human brain spread spread out with full access to to all, what all of the neurons are doing. So so, or do you think that's right? Do you think we have a better chance of success uh, compared to traditional neuroscience? Yeah, yeah, certainly. I think the the sort of uh, mechanistic interpretability people would claim this uh, claim this as well. That um, since we have access to the, the gradients, we have rewrite access to every component of it. Um, this allows for much more controlled, replicable experiments and um, uh, a substantial ability to do science that uh, the barriers to entry in cognitive science uh, um, uh, are many of them are um, removed. <laughs> There's also this might get easier in time. What makes this now possible, whereas previously it wasn't. If you use models like GPT-2 or below, they just the representations are not very good. They're quite incoherent. Um, but as we use larger models like Llama-2, um, pre-trained on many more tokens, they have some emergent internal structure that actually starts to make some sense um, and directions that are correlated with coherent concepts that the humans have. I think earlier it's more like a shibboleth, but now there, since there is some coherence to it, it's not just a big causal soup of connections. Uh, so this is why I think, unfortunately, this wasn't something that we could have uh, particularly done um, in like 2016 uh, and um, is, is very much something that's possible now that previously wasn't. Dan, thanks for spending so much time with us here. It's been very valuable uh, for me and uh, I think it will be for our listeners too. Great, great, great. Thank you for having me. Have a good day.